Well, first of all, <laughs> I have to say hello to Carol. Oh. Hello, yeah. Carol. Hi, Carol. Hi, Carol. We miss you. I really miss uh, being here without her. Yeah, yeah. And we miss her, too. First thing I want to say is, if you did not hear last night's, I don't know what to call it, it's really not a message. It isn't. It's much more than just a message. But it's a truth that has been hidden to most of creation and it's just now being revealed to the masses of people and hopefully we're all able to see and understand have our eyes opened to the truth of what's being said I'd also like to caution you to listen with your heart Because if you're just listening with, with the mind, looking for another good teaching, you'll hear something we call a buzzword. And when you hear what to you is a buzzword, your mind can take off and you won't even hear what is being said the rest of the time. What I mean by that, when I first started uh, teaching what I do now several years ago, I began to speak about how there was no such thing as a literal place where people would spend eternity suffering in hell. Well, when I began to speak that, and you look out over your audience, you could see people that just, they just went nuts. And their mind would take off with that, thinking about how he could say such a thing and not even hear the rest of the message. And that's why I caution people, listen with your heart. Because no matter how much your mind will go against what is being said, if you listen with your heart, it will open you up to the truth that's being said. Mike said something when we were ministering together in January. He said, you cannot have a relationship with God. Now, most people, when they hear a statement like that, there goes their mind. Think of, they start thinking about, how could he say that? And, and perhaps miss the rest of the whole message just by making that one statement. And I had to consider, what did Mike mean when he said you can't have a relationship with God? What I realized right away is Everyone has a concept with God in, of God in their mind. And no matter what that concept is, you th may think you're having a relationship with God, but I can guarantee you the relationship is not with that image that's been concocted in your mind because there is no such God anywhere in this universe. Whatever you think about God and whatever your precept is about God, I can promise you that is not God. That is a false image that's been set up basically by the religious teachings that we've had. I'm sure you've had a relationship, but see our mind cannot understand spiritual things. It's only our spirit that really understands the things of God. That's why Paul said the natural man cannot receive the things of the spirit of God because they are spiritually discerned. Job said there is a spirit in man and the inspiration of the Almighty gives them understanding. Now there's also what is called the natural mind or the natural man which in reality is an illusion he's not even real we believe he's real we study with that natural mind 
We pick up doctrines with that natural mind, but that natural mind cannot possibly understand the things of God. Well, if, if God is not what I've perceived him to be or imagined him to be, what is God? The only thing I can tell you is that God is spirit, and spirit is love, light, and life. What was the first thing that love did in Genesis chapter 1? Because out of love, all things were created. And the first thing in Genesis that came out of light was the spoken word, let there be light. Because wherever there is love, there is light. The first time I ever contacted God in reality, I was filled not only with love, but with light. Uh, and I didn't even understand it at the time because I would go into church and, and for no reason at all, I'd just begin to weep. I had no understanding. Yet, the experience of love filling me brought me into the light. Another thing I discovered, and I used to get mad when I heard this. I used to do some reading of, of the Christian science people. And I got so upset the first time I heard them call God it. Because to me at that time, God was a him. And to it, to me, was, it was just unthinkable to call God an it. But now I fully understand that. And they also would say, God is impersonal. Well, I thought, I have a personal relationship. How can God be impersonal? Well, God being impersonable does not mean you cannot have an ongoing fellowship with spirit. Being impersonal means that he is not, um, what's the word I want to use? Um, he does not prefer one above another. Let me say it that way. I oftentimes share that a good illustration of, of spirit is electricity. And I won't go into this a lot because I've shared it so much, but if you go over here and undo a light socket and you grab that bare wire, that electricity is impersonal. It don't care who you are. It don't care what you've done. It don't care if you are good or bad. You touch that live wire and you're going to get infused with electricity. The same is true with spirit. You have, I shouldn't even say you have a spirit, you are spirit. And whenever you turn within, not without, but whenever you turn within with an open and seeking heart, you will touch the spirit of your being. And every time you touch the spirit, in a living way, that spirit is infused, transmuted, imparted into you, and it will fill you with light. It will renew your mind. It will expand your consciousness, your awareness, and you will become more in tune and more aware of the spiritual truth of your being. So God is impersonal. He don't care if you're good or bad, right or wrong, left or right. I've been saying this for so many years. God only, the spirit, I don't try to get away from that word God, but the spirit only looks at your heart. I was so confused and messed up for years in religion, but my heart was always seeking truth. I used to lay awake at night and cry. I'd go out in the desert in the morning and I'd cry because I wanted to be so much like Jesus. My, as a young boy, I cried. I wanted to be like that man that I read about in the scriptures, not realizing that I was that man. It took years. 
Until one day I heard within my own being, everything you are trying to become, everything you are seeking, you already are. That's light. That's the word coming to you, bringing light and understanding. Light always exposes the darkness. And I couldn't understand for years, every time I got in the light, every time I got into the, what we call the, the presence of God, I would feel so dirty. What I didn't understand is that light always exposes darkness. And that is a wonderful thing. So many people, myself included, for years, I would fall under condemnation when I came into the light not realizing I was so blessed to be able to see and understand that light is supposed to expose darkness. And so when I had that understanding, then I got into deliverance and I was taught about how you bind the devil, you loose, the, you loose God, you do all of this stuff. And so for quite some time, I was binding the darkness I was casting out devils. I mean, literally, I've cast out what my concept was in those days, demons out of people. I've seen them froth at the mouth. I've seen them fall on the floor and shake and scream as the so-called devils would come out of them. I have witnessed and I have been a part of that. Light exposes all the darkness. One day I realized that if you're in a dark room, you don't need to bind the darkness. You can bind the darkness till, till, till the day you fall over. All you need to do if you're in a dark room is turn on the light. And what happens to darkness? Darkness flees in the light. So once you begin to understand that and you get in you know you get into the light, the light just diminishes the darkness. We have been taught so many things and we have believed so many things. You probably won't remember, maybe you do. The first thing I said here, the first time I came here two years ago, I said, your belief will not save you. Amen. People, Christians, all over the world believe a lot of things that does them absolutely no good whatsoever. And so I've been asking people for about six years now, why do you believe what you believe? Why do you believe that? Because the only thing that's going to help you is what you know, not intellectually, but what you have experienced spiritually. That you can hang on to and take to the bank. So many things we've been told. If you believe something strong enough, you will do exactly what you believe and you will experience what you believe. That's why we've got what we call radical Muslims. If you had been taught from a child that teaching and that doctrine, especially if you thought you was going to get a bunch of virgins by blowing yourself up, You'd stand in line to do it. So why do we believe what we believe? I believed everything I was taught in religion until the spirit within me began to stir and question. Why do you believe that? Who told you you were a sinner? Well, the only person or people that ever taught me I was a sinner was the preachers and the religious teachers. I never one time heard within my spirit, you're a sinner. I never heard that and neither have you. We've been told that 
The problem is our old man. I'm going to talk about that a little later. But there's no such thing as the old man. There never has been. Except in your mind and darkened understanding and your experience of being what we call the old man, or living in darkness, or living according to carnality, or living according to a religious standard. That's the old man that in reality does not exist, except in your mind. What you believe is highly debatable. How many times in our past have we got into the debate over doctrine? See, what you believe doctrinally can be debated, but what you know spiritually, there is no debate. That's, right. That's what we call absolute truth. Religion lives in what we call... Um, now I can't even think of what we call it. Relative truth. God does not dwell in relative truth. He deals in absolute truth. And that's why when you hear speaking from your spirit, you, you cannot, you cannot think it's not true. It's just every time God speaks, no matter what it is, I, I used to say that if God, at which he has in the past, has told me to do something, I feel in my spirit that this is what I need to do, then I know if that's God, I don't need to do anything. If if I need to, if I need finances, if I need, it doesn't matter what it is. If I hear God say it, I know that in that speaking is everything I need for that word to be fulfilled in me. I don't need to go out on financial campaigns. I don't need to uh, tell you what I need to do. I just know if God said it. It's done. Amen. <laughs> the purpose of religion is to divide and conquer. Mm -hmm. wow. That's the purpose. That crazy? Yeah. It's divide and conquer. You say, well, that's not me. Oh, really? Are you a Baptist? What do you think about Pentecostals? Would you fellowship with them? Would you go to church with them? No, not me. That tongue speaking, that's of the devil. Well, what if you're a Pentecostal? And you say, I'm not divisive. I believe we're, I believe we're one. Oh, really? Would you fellowship with a Baptist? Would you go to a Baptist church? There's a lot of things we know. A lot of people today know about oneness. They know it. They know we're all one. They know we all came out of one spirit. They know that there's nothing but God. Yet that system of divide and conquer is still within them. They don't, they don't realize it. Because what they believe is that they're standing for the truth. No matter what religion you're in, you're in a box. And to come out of that box is one of the most difficult things. In fact, it's impossible. That's true. Until you have some spiritual awakening, you will not come out of your doctrinal belief system. And I can promise you doctrines that divide and conquer are of the devil. if you believe in such a creature. So most of us, we need to forget what we've been taught. I'll never forget the day that I came to that awareness. Because for years I had studied, I'd studied all the doctrines, the rapture, the everything, the second coming. And I had notebooks full of notes. And I thought I had a lot of stuff figured out. And when I began to come into some of this understanding, I asked God, 
I didn't think it was possible at the time, but I said, if you can, if it's possible, I would like to erase everything I've learned and know. I took all of my notes. I took the Bible that I had had for years and I threw everything into the fire and burned it up. That was one of the greatest things I ever did. But even for years after that, I still held on to these concepts that I'd been taught. How can you not hold on to something that you've been taught and believed for years? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Most of what we've been taught is not truth. There is such an awakening taking place today all over the earth. And so many people in religion think that God wants to bring his kingdom to the world. In fact, I remember Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. There's a difference between the world and the earth. The world is this system that's been set up basically by religion, by politics, by everything that the world system consists of is the world. God is not interested in bringing his kingdom into that mess. The Spirit is establishing His kingdom on the earth. What does that mean? Well, it means God is raising up a people in these days, pouring forth so much light and energy and spirit that it will literally transform this, what we call this earth. And you will be a people who are operating and living and manifesting the spirit. It said in scriptures, the meek shall inherit the earth. Not the world, but the earth. See, the spirit is interested in coming to earth and establishing you in his love, in his manifestation, everything that, that the Spirit is, is wanting to come in this earth and manifest what he is. When all the Christians, what they talk about is dying and going to heaven. So Christians want to go to heaven and Spirit wants to come to earth. Who do you think is going to win? <laughs> I'm going to talk about some of the erroneous teachings that we've had. One of them is, and I believed this for years, I strongly believed it, the Bible is the Word of God. I can promise you today that's absolutely false. The Bible is the Word of men about God to the best of their understanding. And to me, the Bible is one of the most valuable commodities on earth. Now, I know a lot of people don't like the Bible, and that's understandable. But I'll tell you, if you can glean the wisdom and the understanding that the scriptures will give you, you will highly value it. What you don't value is the interpretation that men have placed on that Bible. Because it's not the Word of God. And as we go on, I'm going to share some of the I'm going to prove to you it's not the Word of God. One of the big issues that Mike talked about last night, and he said enough, so I don't need to say a lot about it, is what about the cross and sin? I have, I have written 
books about the cross of sin. So why would I say today, which I'm going to say, the teaching of the cross causes division and separation? So how could I so value it earlier in my life and have experienced having my life changed because of my belief And I understand that, and, and hopefully I, I can sh have the words to explain it. Why at one time in your life these teachings are so valuable, yet when you have an understanding, it's really a deeper understanding and a deeper appreciation for what has happened. How can I say the cross causes division? Well, the very first thing you're taught as a Christian, especially if you're a fundamentalist, is that you're just an old sinner saved by grace. Yeah. And that whatever Adam did in the garden, it was so bad, and it so made God angry that God required a blood sacrifice to forgive you. Now here's a God that so loved the world, or his, his creation, he brought forth man in his own image. Yet when that man made a mistake and did what God said not to do, the only way that that man could be forgiven is by a blood sacrifice. And they say they can prove that because when Adam sinned, what did God do? He clothed them with skin. And they say he, you know, that was the first animal sacrifice because he clothed them with the skin of an animal. No, he clothed them with what you see today. To consider the fact that God requires blood to be forgiven is absolutely paganistic. Yes. What did you do that was so bad that would cause God to require somebody to die for your badness so you could be forgiven. You see, that's not logical. Well, and in, in religious teaching, God, God is not logical. He's not logical at all in the religious teaching. Because on one hand, he loves you enough that he, he sent his own son to die for you so you could be forgiven. But... If you don't walk the line, then all that sacrifice is for nothing and you're going to end up in a fire pit. That's not logical. Is that logical? No, it's not logical. So why did that teaching benefit me so much? I had to question that myself. Because I believe that so strongly. I wrote a book called Coming Out of Condemnation. And literally, I can't tell you, untold thousands of issues of that book has been sent to over 70 countries of the world. And I have got testimony after testimony of people who say they read that book and they've been set free from guilt and condemnation. I had that book, one guy give it to his, uh, I think it was his mother, some relative of his, in a mental institution. And she read that book, Coming Out of Condemnation, and her mind cleared up. And she was released from the mental institution. So how can I say that is valueless? When it changed my life so much. I say, why was that necessary? Why couldn't I have just known the truth from the very beginning? I'll tell you why. 
because mankind was so lost in his thinking, in his awareness, Man had been taught for years that he was born in sin and corruption. He'd been taught for years that his natural being was, was evil. And man was so fallen in his consciousness, he needed something to identify with. He needed, to be, he needed something that would relieve his consciousness from so much guilt and shame. To tell a man in that condition of what we know today, he can't receive that. We needed something to identify with. And the teaching of the cross, the teaching It was all to give us something to identify with, to be, able to, to be able to look and say, God loved me so much that he sent his son to die for me. And if I really believe that, and I believe some of the other scriptures that said, God justifies the ungodly, that will release my guilt and condemnation. And from that point, I can then go on to receive deeper and deeper truth and understanding. So what about the blood sacrifice? I'm going to read you a scripture from, uh, from the Bible. Only by the shedding of blood can our sins be forgiven. Someone must die in order for sins to be forgiven. That is why God requires blood sacrifices. Later, at the time of Moses, God formally established the regulations for animal sacrifice. These sacrifices were symbolic of Jesus' ultimate sacrifice. That really sounds good, but it's just not true. And there was a time when I needed to hear that. I can't tell you the value that came to me when I understood that God was not holding me accountable for sin. And I thought it was because of the blood sacrifice. I read something that Charles Stanley said. Charles Stanley, Stanley is taken from one of his writings. And he's one of the most notable speakers even today. I used to listen to Charles Stanley every time he came on the air. And this is what he says. As soon as I find it. He says, we tend to look back on all those bloody sacrifices and think, I'm sure glad that doesn't apply to me. But if we pass too quickly over them, we'll miss seeing what our salvation cost the Savior. You see, he was our blood sacrifice. Redemption would not have worked if he'd simply died for us in his sleep, because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That's pure ignorance. Although as sincere as all of these people are, <coughs> they're sincerely mistaken. Think about it. I'm speaking to those now. Have you really, really deeply experienced the love of God? Have you ever been overwhelmed by his presence and his love? If you have, then you cannot possibly believe that God would require somebody to die so that you could live. You see, our consciousness is evolving. Re I should say evolving. Our consciousness is evolving. Do you think today that you could get God's people, <coughs> I'm speaking, uh, I'm sure you could get some, but suppose that today somebody would teach again that God requires a blood sacrifice. Who would do that? 
I don't think your consciousness today would allow you to kill animals so you could be forgiven. I talked about this probably about 15 years ago. I did two messages on the uh, evolution of consciousness. And you see, that's what's happening to us. The reason we're beginning to understand these things today is because our consciousness ha is evolving. It's expanding to where we're beginning to understand now that everything that God is, we are. Would you require somebody to die? What if your son was brought up in court <coughs> and he was condemned to die? Would you be willing to sacrifice another so he could live? Now, I know some people would do that, but you wouldn't. And if you wouldn't do it, how can you think God would do it? Another thing we've been taught, what about prayer? Oh my God. Anybody who prays to a God out there somewhere doesn't have a clue about what we're talking about. Well, you might be, maybe now you're beginning to have a clue, but you're still questioning. Nobody, I don't think, maybe some, I don't think anybody has prayed more in their lifetime than I have. I think I've mentioned this before, but I, I, used to, I used to go in my room every Saturday and tell Carol, <coughs> I was just starting to pastor then, telling Carol, I don't, I don't want no phone calls, I don't want no visitors, you leave me alone. And I stayed in that room for a minimum of eight hours every Saturday, and all I did was pray. All to no avail. <laughs> I'd like to ask you, how many prayers in your lifetime have you prayed and asked God for? How many times has that been answered? You could probably count them on one hand. Am I saying that prayer is of, to no avail? That kind of prayer is useless. It's praying amiss. It's like Joel Goldsmith called a Santa Claus God. You think if you're good, if you pray, if you read your Bible, we've all been taught this in church. Mm -hmm. You read your Bible, you pray, you do good things, God's going to bless you. And that's what the Bible says. You do good, God's going to bless you. In Deuteronomy 28, that's what it's all about. You do good, you do what I command you. And you'll be blessed in the field, you'll be blessed, your cattle will be blessed, your families will be blessed. About 15 verses of blessing just for obeying God. But all if you break the commandment. And the scripture says if you break one commandment, you're guilty of all. So what the hell? We just well live it up because we're all going to break it one time or another. But if you break the law, those 15 verses of cursing turn into about 53 verses of cursing. Santa Claus God, you better be good. Better not pout. Santa Claus is coming. And if you're bad, whew, not only will you be cursed, you'll end up in a fire pit. And I highly value prayer, but I know what it is. Prayer is simply speaking what you know to be the truth. Example, let's say if somebody comes to me and, and I get mail all the time about prayer requests, if I really, gee, I, I have to sense 
I have to know that what I'm doing is what I'm supposed to be doing. But I don't pray in, in the religious sense for that person. I speak light. I speak love. I'll speak blessing out of my being for that person. But to pray and ask God to come down and heal Aunt Molly's toe, you are wasting your breath. There is no God outside of you that's coming to do anything for you. Because you have it all. You just don't know it. And that's what's being revealed. Did Jesus take away sin? Well, that depends upon what you mean by sin, because sin has been classified as drinking and smoking and chewing and running with women, and it, that's not a clue. That's the works of the flesh. But sin is you being separated and alienated from the truth of your being. That's all it is. If Jesus didn't die on the cross for our sins, what was it all about? Well, he gave a parable that tells you exactly what it was about. In Matthew chapter 21, and this is Jesus. Listen to another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard, put a hedge around it, dug a wine vat in it, and built a watchtower. When the fruit of the season drew near, or when it was, you know, ripe, time to, to glean from the village, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his share of the fruit. But the tenants took his servants, beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Now listen, Jesus is telling a story about himself. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first time the prophets that came. And they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his own son to them, saying, they will surely respect and give heed to my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Let us kill him and have his inheritance. That's the story of why Jesus went to the cross. Because religious people were determined to kill the truth. It's like Mike said last night, if Jesus had never said a word, he wouldn't have been crucified. It, it was his speaking the truth that put him on the cross. And when you begin to understand and especially when you begin to speak the truth, you will be crucified. Maybe not literally, they would if they could today. But you will be crucified. I've lost a wife over this. I've lost a son who I haven't seen since he was three years old. Anybody that tells you there's not a price for truth doesn't know truth. But Jesus didn't die because I was a sinner. He died to reveal the truth of my being. To show me that even death cannot hold down life. That's the truth. He came to reveal, number one, the truth of his Father. And to demonstrate for us our true being. For if the Spirit of Christ abides in you, that same spirit will raise you from among the dead. Mm -hmm. Right now, 
because the dead aren't in the graves. The dead is in your mind. We have been being raised from the dead since the very first time we ever experienced the reality of the love of God. Your resurrection began. And it won't end until you're fully resurrected out of this separation consciousness. Hebrews 10.8 Above, when he said sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither had pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then he said, lo, I come to do thy will. It's in, the, it's in their own scriptures that God says in offering and sacrifices for sin. I had no pleasure. It's right there in black and white. Hebrews what? That's Hebrews 10, 8 and 9. It's also in the Old Testament. It's, that's actually a quote from the Old Testament. That in sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings for sin, Thou wouldest not, neither had pleasure therein. So why are we still teaching a blood sacrifice? It's only for those people who are so lost in their darkened mind and understanding. It gives them the hope of being okay in God. So you can show Christians something that's even in the, in the, what they call the infallible word, and they still not, might not believe it. I have an aunt, in fact, I, a lot of my relatives on my mother's side are Catholics, and there's a lot of them that are priests and Catholic sisters. But my aunt lived with us for a while. And you could show her something in the Bible. And she'd say, well, that's not what the Pope says. <laughs> And she was so cute, and she loved God. I mean, you couldn't deny that. But see, there's, there's, there's a lot of people who, who really love God that have no spiritual understanding at all. I've made a lot of people mad because I've said that David in the Old Testament, he did not know God. He had a heart for God, and I'm sure he loved God. But David would stand and pray for God to kill his enemies, to, you know, to to give him victory over his enemies and killing them and in war. and uh, That's not knowing God. That's knowing the God of the Old Testament. I don't know who that God is. Might be an Anunnaki. Oh, that's just for people who might understand that. But anyway, uh, <laughs> that so-called being portrayed in the Old Testament, that's not God. I can promise you it's not God. That is man returning God's favor. What do I mean by that? Well, in the beginning, God created man in his image. And after the fall, man created God in his image. That's the Old Testament, good and evil living from that tree of right and wrong. That's the God of the Old Testament. The so-called God mentioned in the Old Testament is definitely not the father of Jesus. And Jesus himself proved that with his own words. He broke the Sabbath laws One of the illustrations in the, in the so-called God of the Old Testament, boy, I'll tell you what, he was a tyrant. You either did what he said or you were dust. In Numbers chapter 15 and verse 32 begins talking about a man who was gathering wood on the Sabbath. That was forbidden, you know. 
on Friday you had to gather enough wood, enough food. I, listen, this probably sounds ridiculous, but I lived next door for a while to a Seventh-day Adventist. And on Fridays, she would pull up enough toilet paper to last her through the weekend because she would not even tear a roll of toilet paper off a roll on the Sabbath day. So this guy was gathering wood on the Sabbath because he forgot on Friday, evidently, to get enough wood for the weekend. And so they went to Moses and said, what do we do with this man we caught gathering wood? Think about that. He was gathering wood on the Sabbath day. What do we do with this guy? Well, God sought Moses and God said, kill him. <laughs> Just kill him. What did Jesus think about that kind of teaching? Well, he said in Matthew 12, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Now, did that not contradict what I just read? It totally blows them out of the water. Hmm? Blows them out of the water. In 1 Samuel 15 and verse 3, Now go, attack the Amalekites, and totally destroy everything that belongs to them. Do not spare them, put to death men, women, children, infants, cattle, sheep, camels, and donkeys. In other words, let's do an ethnic cleansing. That's what that is. Yet today, we condemn people in these countries to do ethnic cleansing. But we somehow justify the acts of the tyrant in the Old Testament that would kill everybody who didn't agree with him. What did Jesus think about that? Well, he said in Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 43, you have heard, now where did they hear this? You have heard... It was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes the, his son to rise on the evil and the good, sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. You see, that's why I said he came to reveal the truth of his Father and the truth of you. One and the same. No separation. No difference. See, I know religious people are so bound up in these doctrinal traditions. But if you'll just think, think about what is being shared. Just think about it. You've been told that God is unconditional love. He regards you, or, or He loves you regardless of what you're doing. Yet He used to be an ethnic cleanser. Religion will tell you, well, you know, after the period of grace came in, Jesus died for sin, so God don't do that no more. God changed. God, the scriptures say God never changes. There's no change in God. So because he let his son die, he now loves everybody with an unconditional love? Be logical. Use your brain for something besides a hat rat. Religion is very illogical. And I've had preachers argue with me that there's no contradiction, there's no difference between Jehovah and Jesus. Boy, are you blind. And this thing, up, I'm going to quit here in a minute. What time are you going? 10.30. Okay. And I forgot what I was going to say, so maybe I'll just end it. This thing you said, 
Jehovah and God, Jehovah, between Jehovah and Jesus. Oh, no, no difference between God and Jesus. Again, read the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament and, and ask yourself, could this guy that did ethnic cleansing would kill people for breaking the Sabbath? That was Jesus' father? And then I tell people this all the time. Please, read the red. You have a red letter edition? Read that. And you'll find all kind of contradictions between what the God did in the Old Testament and what Jesus' portrayal of his father. That, that dude in the Old Testament was not the father of Jesus. And he's not your father either. He's the, if he's the father of anything, it would be the carnal mind because that's what created him, was the carnal mind. That's where he came from. Anyway, let's take a break. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, everybody. We'll be, we'll be back in about 20 minutes, about 10.20. So we'll see you in just a little bit.